Hello, today we're going to be talking about consciousness and attention. Uh, this is a, a very fairly quick and brief lecture, simply talking about some of the overlapping issues with consciousness and attention and how we oftentimes study attention that's independent of consciousness or unconscious attention. So when we talk about consciousness and attention, the first thing we have to do is distinguish the two. Consciousness is directly concerned with awareness. That includes both the feeling of awareness and the content of awareness. So things that we are consciously aware of would be our consciousness. Attention and conscious consciousness partially overlap, but not entirely. There are memories that we uh, don't have conscious awareness of, perceptions that we attend to but are not aware of, things that we have processed uh, perceptually that we did not reach the level of conscious awareness. Which brings us to the role of conscious attention. Uh, conscious attention is involved in monitoring our interactions with the environment. So this is linking our past, which are our memories of course, with our present, which are current sensations, to provide a continuity of experience. Attention also allows us to control and plan for future actions. So the role of conscious attention is to provide us with a way to direct our cognitive resources to gather information from the environment and also link that with our recent experience. And so it's always an ongoing process of providing this continuity of experience by linking our past with our present and also by directing our resources uh, in our current environment and also to control and plan for our future actions. There are a variety of ways that we study uh, what we call pre-conscious processing or attention without awareness. The first of these is a fairly standard cognitive psychology paradigm referred to as priming. This occurs when processing of a stimulus is facilitated by a prior presentation of the same or similar, stim simul similar stimulus. Pardon me. Um, we demonstrate that priming has occurred generally by faster reaction times and improved accuracy in these kinds of experiments. So what we can do is we can infer that you have processed that previous stimulus even though you won't consciously be aware of the fact that it's been presented and we see that by faster reaction times and improved accuracy. So uh, down below here we see sort of a typical priming experiment. We'll have some sort of prime which will appear for about usually 33 milliseconds is the longest we can go on these. That's followed by a backward pattern mask. The purpose of this backward pattern mask is to remove this prime from sensory memory. That is we have to sort of overwrite it. Uh, if we did not include this backward pattern mask, even though this wasn't still on the screen, you would actually still be able to see it for a brief period of time afterwards. So that backward pattern mask keeps that from happening. We then get uh, what's called the probe, and then we get a participant response. So usually the participant's response is, is it a word or a non-word? Is it a category of some kind or another? So for example, at the top here, uh, we would see um, a prime followed by a probe. Of course, the response, participant response would be, I'm oh, sorry, prime backward pattern mask probe. And the participant will respond with word. They'll be faster in this repetition priming example than in this other example, which is non-repetition priming. And of course, these others here are simply uh, to show you what they might get if they were going to be presented with a non-word. So obviously, we have to have both words and non-words, uh, so we can see uh, that their reaction time is indeed faster uh, to words, particularly if the same word was presented previously. So this is repetition priming. This would be an example of semantic priming, and this is something we'll talk uh, a lot more about later on in the term. So you can see in the top row we have banana and apple, which are directly related to one another, school and apple, which aren't really related, so we would expect you to respond to the word apple when previously primed with the word banana. Again, even though you won't remember having seen it, or report having seen it, you'll be faster at identifying the word apple because we have primed the category of fruits. So that'll be important later on in the term. Uh, other ways we look at uh, pre-conscious processing is by uh, examining what's called the tip of the tongue phenomenon. Uh, this occurs when we try to remember something that we know is stored in memory but can't quite retrieve it fully from memory. 
So what we're trying to do is we're attempting to pull that pre-conscious information into consciousness. So essentially we know the information is available, we just simply aren't able to bring it to our conscious awareness. Um, this is really difficult to study. Um, I know some people who work in this area. Uh, it really requires some very clever, very interesting ways of, uh, of conducting research. And uh, I will actually post uh, a link to uh, a colleague who does some of this work who has a really great TED talk on this uh, phenomenon. So what's happening here is you're trying to pull pre-conscious information into consciousness. Uh, we've all had this happen. Usually it's we're trying to remember somebody's name or a celebrity's name. You know, that one guy that was in that movie with, what's her name? Um, it's something we all have experienced. It's simply a question of uh, how we study that in the laboratory. Uh, in patient populations, we can study what's called blind sight. Uh, these are individuals who have damage to their primary visual cortex. So these patients have perfectly normal eyes. Uh, the rest of their visual pathway is intact from the um, retina through the lateral geniculate nucleus and the thalamus onto the visual cortex, but they've had some sort of brain damage to the visual cortex, brain tumor, um, stroke, some sort of damage to that part of the um, visual cortex. They'll have an area in their visual field in which they cannot consciously perceive any stimulus, and this area is called a scotoma. So when it looks something like this, this is a rough, it doesn't look anything like this. This is a rough idea, whereas the blind sight patient might be looking at something and there'll be an area that they can't see. Uh, it's usually never this big, and usually they aren't even aware of the fact that they have a scotoma. Oftentimes their brain will fill in with surrounding information, and so stuff sort of just disappears there. So it really wouldn't look like this in their experience. Now, the problem is, um, one, because they're oftentimes not aware of it, it's just like with the blind spot we all already have, which is um, where our optic nerve exits the retina, um, your brain fills in that surrounding area. These patients, visual information is coming from the retina, unlike our blind spots. Um, information is coming from the retina to the brain, but it's not going through the primary visual cortex. But if you present, stimulate in these areas, patients can report the, uh, the identity and location of objects presented in that blind area at above chance levels, even though they can't consciously report that. So again, it'd be kind of like a priming experiment. You could put a word there and then ask them which of these words was presented uh, recently, and they'll uh, guess at above chance levels the item that was presented. So an issue that comes up with consciousness is this question of automatic versus controlled processes. And this is another area in attention that um, we've talked a little bit about in terms of automaticity requiring less conscious resources. So automa automatic processes involve uh, no conscious control. These are things that occur without conscious awareness. They demand little or no effort or even intention. They're performed relatively fast they're usually performed in parallel, that is more than one process at a time. So things that are we do automatically, um, we can do have more than one, as long as they're not taking up the same resource, um, we can take up those tasks uh, at the same time. So you can walk and chew gum at the same time, walk and talk at the same time, because these things are, are accomplished relatively automatically. So they're fast, and again, they can be performed in parallel. Controlled processes require conscious effort, and they have to be performed what we call serially. That is, you can only be doing one at a time. Uh, they require more time and more effort to perform. So things that require conscious control are eating up a lot of resources. And so anytime we're diverting our attention to something else, we're eating into these other controlled processes. And while some things may feel automatic, they aren't always. So for example, texting on your phone is not an automatic process that requires conscious effort because you have to think about what you're going to say, you have to consciously figure out where the keys are because you can't really do that automatically anymore, um, you never really could. But it requires time and effort to perform and you'll always be taking away from uh, those uh, other processes that you're trying to accomplish. 
So automatization is the process by which a procedure can change from being highly conscious to relatively automatic. And this occurs as the result of practice. So this is, this is any skill, particularly motor skill, you might be trying to acquire will go through this process. When you learned how to use a keyboard, started out as a very deliberative, conscious process, and most of you can now do it without conscious awareness of which keys you're hitting. Same thing with learning to play the piano or any other instrument. Uh, eventually, your responses become automatic. Same for any skill, hitting a baseball, playing tennis. It stops becoming consciously controlled and becomes automatic. So one of the things we need to be sure of is understanding that practice effects tend to be nonlinear. So this would be an example of a linear effect. So if each time you practice, your performance would improve by the same, you know, sort of same increment. Practice effects, however, have what's called a negative acceleration curve. That is, we tend to gain the most improvements in performance early on until eventually we'll reach some sort of plateau where we'll sort of become as automatic as possible. Um, this is what training is all about. It's about um, taking things, uh, making them uh, better and better and better until they become relatively automatic. Now, important to understand, um, this maximum sort of performance isn't the same for everyone, and sometimes you can reach a maximum and then push through it and gain more. So oftentimes athletes, for example, uh, will sort of plateau, and then they'll have to switch up their training routine to try to push through that to get even further on. Same thing with uh, things like um, piano practice. You may be performing pieces and you reach a plateau and you need to try harder pieces so then you can start that and learn further and then you'll get very good at those and then move on to the next level so these can be um, sort of stacked on top of one another important again to understand that automatization occurs once something is fully automated it doesn't require any conscious control and oftentimes that's the goal of training particularly when we're talking about things like law enforcement officers secret service agents um, people in the military Oftentimes we don't want people, in those instances, we don't always want them to think before acting. Now, one of the problems is, because of that training, sometimes they act without thinking and we end up with some seriously tragic consequences, which we'll talk about later on in the term. Um, but certainly for something like the Secret Service, they have these practice drills which need to happen automatically without anyone stopping to think about what's happening. One person jumps in front of the gunman, another person grabs the president, uh, or the protectee, um, probably three or four of them actually pile on top of the president, shove them into a car, and then there's a whole other series of events that happen automatically. And again, that's on purpose, because we don't want, in order to protect the president, you have to make sure these things happen quickly. So examples, again, of how automatization occurs, driving, riding a bicycle, and military and police training are all examples of how we might make something become automatic. Now I want to talk about a few uh, bits of lingo in this area that are important to understand. We'll start with habituation. Habituation occurs when we begin to notice the stimulus less and less the longer it is present. That is, we stop attending to it. We stop paying any attention to it. So habituation is an attention phenomenon. Um, so and basically what happens is a big part of our attention system is designed to automatically attend to things that might be dangerous to us. So anytime something's new uh, in our environment, we oftentimes won't pay any attention. We'll pay close attention to it, and then once we're used to it, we kind of decide that it's obviously not a threat, and we dishabituate. Or sorry, we, we habituate to it. Now, dishabituation occurs when a change in a stimulus redirects our attention towards a, a habituated stimulus. So something that has been sitting there for a long time that suddenly moves, we're going to suddenly pay attention to it, or if it suddenly changes. Um, things like, you know, light changes color, or, you know, flashes, or changes in some way, oftentimes will automatically capture our attention. So while uh, we may habituate to the presence of a stimulus, well, we can easily dishabituate to it if it suddenly changes. Uh, and this happens with people and animals all the time. So to give you an example, um, one of my corgis, Dante, 
when he was pretty young, um, probably two, maybe three years old, uh, we got a Christmas tree for the first time, and he was very upset by that. Corgis are very OCD. So he barked at it for the first day or two, and then he just kind of eyed it suspiciously, and then he finally got used to it until one day I was cleaning house and had to move the Christmas tree, so it moved, which completely dishabituated to him. Another day of barking, another day of eyeing it suspiciously. Um, so that's habituation. It's an attentional phenomenon. Very different from that is sensory adaptation. And sensory adaptation occurs when our sensory systems simply stop responding to the constant presence of a stimulus. So this is something like a sound that never changes. Um, like you get a spot on your glasses, you stop seeing it because it's simply completely unchanged and your sensory system simply isn't sending sensory signals about it. Habituation, those signals are going, you just simply aren't paying attention to them. Other examples of sensory adaptation are things like um, scent. You habituate to scents very easily, um, which is why people will put cologne on or perfume on, and then they'll wear it around for a few hours, and then they don't smell it anymore, so they put more on. And so by the time they interact with us, really stink pretty. Um, similarly, people that kind of aren't so fresh don't notice that they're not so fresh because they've been walking around in their own filth all day. <laughs> and so they don't smell it anymore. Some of you may have actually had this happen um, where you um, go away for a weekend or several days and come back and walk into your house or apartment and go, Jesus Christ, is it always this smelly? Um, particularly if you're like me, yeah, we have dogs. And so sometimes you walk, you go away for a week and come back and like, good God, this house smells like dogs. Um, and that's because your sensory system is sort of unadapted to it because it's not constant anymore. So here are some key terms from today's lecture. You'll definitely want to know. Um,